aperture. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I want to especially thank Robert, too, for joining us um, tonight. This is a really special, lucky um, attendance. So um, Robert coming, as Sarah mentioned, I did my, my master's thesis on his 1970s photography. He grew up on the um, outside of Boston and uh, attended the Massachusetts College of Art um, for painting. And um, after that, went directly to the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and um, so kind of relocated to the Midwest, ended up sticking around in the Midwest for a while. Um, and then in 1970, uh, decided that um, he might do better somewhere else with his artwork. So he decided to pack up and head out to California, um, landing in Southern California. I think Fullerton, was it? Fullerton started teaching, doing more work. Um, I will we'll be talking a little bit about this in more detail as we go along. But So uh, California was lucky enough to have him for until 1978, and then he uh, moved back to the East Coast, um, ended up in Cal Connecticut, teaching again, and um, has kind of stuck around this area ever since, now located in Massachusetts. So um, over the years, I... I I've learned um, that a lot of contemporary artists seem to be very influenced by Robert's work. Um, I learned about him first from a young artist named Joey Lehman Morris. I was a fellow at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and um, I was just you know, in a meeting, and this artist mentioned him as a big influence on his work, and so I, I ran to my desk and looked up Robert, and it was a little confusing because there's another guy named Robert Cummings who was in a television show in the 60s about a photographer. It was a sitcom. <laughs> but uh, I eventually <laughs> figured it out. It was not the Bob Cummings show, but it was Robert Cummings, the photographer. And I came up upon this image. Um, this is the first image I saw. And I uh, was immediately taken. And it really, I thought it was just completely mysterious and also very funny. And at the time, I thought that it also kind of reminded me of some contemporary artists that I was very interested in while I was in school, like Sarah Vanderbeek and Leslie Hewitt. And I saw some kind of reminiscent stuff here, so I just, I, I really dug it, and I just kept looking, and I kept thinking about his work. And, um, and that's when I decided that I wanted to learn more and found that it was a little bit hard to find information on him, so I thought this would be a perfect thesis topic, um, and just delved in. And so my general ar argument in my thesis was that looking at his work is a really dynamic process, um, kind of due to the nature of humor and uh, sort of the disconnect of absurdity, as well as um, the kind of gyroscoping of comprehension that comes with uh, perceptual illusions. So I think we'll touch upon a lot of this in our talk today, in our discussion. Um, I wanted to ask just some general questions that will give you some background on him as an artist. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with his work, but maybe some of you aren't. And then um, we're going to speak a lot about his process of coming up with his ideas and how he made his images, because it's kind of complex and a very interesting story about how he did this elaborate uh, construction to create some of his images. So I wanted to start by saying that, Robert, you grew up the son of a, an electrical engineer, and your brothers and sister sort of went into the medical and nuclear science fields. So how is it that you became inspired to, to become an artist? Uh, I, I, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> um, I think I, I hadn't heard, uh, I, hadn't, I wasn't aware that you could be an artist as a profession until I was a senior in high school. And there was one extremely influ influential uh, teacher who, who, who asked me, what are you going to do with your life? I said, well, I haven't really decided yet. Maybe I'll be an airline pilot. But he had been letting me do um, uh, drawings for, for um, 
term projects instead of just you know written term papers. Yeah. So it's probably his you know responsible for he's he's the one responsible for setting the. Didn't he hand you he handed you a pamphlet for Massachusetts College of Art or something? Yeah, I had no idea there was a this, such a thing as an art college. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I just didn't have a clue. So it, you know, he gave me a little bit of a push in that direction. Right. Um, my parents and my brother and sisters, I think they just kind of, they shrug a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But supportive. But supportive. And then you were, you were studying painting. And, and as you came out of getting your MFA, you decided to go into more three-dimensional work. And I wanted to show some of that. Um, these are early sculptures that Robert constructed. And they were always sort of these very functional looking utilitarian objects that really had no function at all. Um, some of them you could wear. For instance, this one. Can you tell us a little bit about how this one worked? Uh, Wegman and I did a series of performances. William Wegman. William Wegman did a series of performances, one of which was at the, uh, the Electric Circus here in New York in the, I guess in the late 60s. Um, this was a costume I designed for myself, and the, the bags are little uh, packets of um, detergent, soap powder, which uh, glows extremely bright in, in under black light. So I had I had each one of the bags attached off stage to to varying lengths of shock cord, and as I came out on the stage backing up, the shortest one would start to pull, and I couldn't go any further. I would have to cut it with a scissor, and it would let off a, one of these blue, uh, blue explosions, <laughs> and so on, and so on, and so Sounds on, until so the cool. last until the last bag was gone. Yeah. And, it uh, uh, set the entire audience sneezing. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and um, and then in the late, I find it interesting that in the late '60s you also started to get into mail art. And um, this was something that sort of evolved over the years, I think, into the 70s. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, various, I mean, I remember you telling me that you would ship basically like garage door string, springs or, or um, branches or dry cleaning paper to both uh, friends and strangers. But it was, it was also an interesting segue from your sculptural practice because you were using your sculpture as your mail art as well. Right. It was just a way to disseminate the work and not um, um, somehow. It was it was to kind of take the seriousness away from it because everything that went out just, you know, necess out of necessity may not have come back. Uh huh. Some came back, some didn't. Yeah. And just experimenting. Including responses, because you were a really big letter writer. I used to do at least ten pages a day, just as kind of setting up. Ten Excellent. different letters, ten to ten different addresses. For for different projects, I was doing with different people, uh -huh. who sometimes didn't realize they were part of the project. Part of the pro for instance, Mrs. Winks here was kind of a project. It's a very long story. I yes, think. it is a long story. But this is actually from um, one of his artist books called Picture Fictions, um, one of the spreads from 1971. And artist books also were kind of an interesting aspect, or almost part of the male art project, because, because you realized that once you were getting into photography, this was a very easy way to disseminate your, your work and um, to a large amount of people. Um, and I think this is the complete set of all of the artist books that you've made since 1970? Uh, yeah, since about 70, 71. And then the oldest being picture fictions at the top and then followed by the little, the smaller book at the top, Way to Franchise Meat. And then um, the three beige colored books were kind of a trilogy. Yeah. They were from 73, 75. And for me, the most important one was the Equilibrium and the Rotary Disc. I think we'll run into pictures from that. Yeah, we'll see some pictures from that. And it's, it's something like seven different, these all incorporate, except for picture fictions and way to franchise meat, they all incorporate text and narrative with images. And um, Equilibrium and the Rotary Disc, I think, is the most complex and um, sort of psychedelically crazy story, it's, or seven different stories all, all uh, intertwined. Wow. That sounded like a Rotary Disc. <laughs> We've got sound effects. 
<laughs> the circular saws are coming. Um, Is it a karate studio? What are they? <laughs> <laughs> I just we'll have to we'll have to live with it. Oh, closer or down? <laughs> Maybe hold it down. Hold it in the middle, and then like right around. Is it this way? Yay! Yeah. Okay, That's good. better. Yes. So, after moving to California, packing up the VW bus here. Um, you, you, and this is actually a work that you did for a Douglas, Douglas Hubler curated Doug, show. Douglas Hubler decided to put out um, a call for pieces uh, dealing with five foot by six foot by eight foot spaces. I'm not sure where he got those dimensions, but I realized it was almost the exact size of my VW bus. <laughs> so basically, wherever I drove the bus was part of the piece on the move. That's perfect. Driving not, of course, with the um, the two by fours, yeah, and clothesline rope. And um, upon arriving in California, um, one of the things I thought was really interesting is that you and you, you began to encounter uh, these continuity stills that you started collecting from movie memorabilia shop uh, shops around Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And um, really, they were only about twenty five cents a piece. Right. So you have like hundreds of them now. Hundreds and hundreds. Yeah. Thousands. And these were things that you would show your students as kind of um, examples of photographs. I think that it's, you know, you said this, but it's fascinating that these were kind of made with the same process and technique that you were using, which was the 8x10 view camera with contact printed, you know, something that in the 60s and earlier, um, the rise of modernist photography was considered to be, you know, the pristine way to make a print. And yet these... Uh, continuity stills were kind of like stuffed in boxes and written on and folded and, tear and torn and hole punched and, and so. They, and they always had somewhere in it a, a slate. Yeah. With a stick with a title and the director's name. And oh, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, this one, for instance, has got the uh, the holes on the left hand side for somebody's ring binder. You know, went into some kind of ring binder filing system. Um, some reference number number 49 is from ink on the negative. Um, the canoe, when you when you look at it uh, closely enough, it's just made out of flat, flat wood. And it I has, can and I see the slate too. It's always kind of like a, a yeah. puzzle. To, do you have the laser pointer? Watch, watch out. Yeah. There's the slate. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, so this kind of this this became very inspiring for you, and well, the amount of work uh, you know required to go through you know to make something like that. Could we go back a little? Yeah, sure. Um, and the foreground, you have the uh, the tracks for the camera for the dolly in shot. Yeah. Um, there's a rear projection screen behind the whole thing, and that over would here, over probably here. show a, a lake or something. And motion and motion like ducks or birds. Yeah. And this is a person. Uh, adjusting a pine bow on a tripod, and I believe this is waved in front of the um, a light to create the sensation of um, wind blowing through the trees. Oh, of course. Kind of enlivens yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. But that much that much work for that kind of little game was just you know, just really impressive. Yes. I thought, and the fact that it was shot with an eight by ten view camera. Yes, and you had been shooting your own. Sculptures with an eight by ten view camera. This incredible, you know, this incredibly detailed negative, using that to give um, an impression of the sculptures that he was making to send out to juried shows. And after kind of spending some time with these things, and also beginning to get into photography in California, you started to think about those photographs of sculptures um, somewhat differently, and um, thinking them of them as works in and of themselves. So. From that, we sort of segue into these fabricated photos that you've created in your backyard or elsewhere. Actually, the one the previous was that down was, at was at Cal State Long Beach. Got it. Yeah, and you were you were really doing something kind of different than other photographers of the 1970s. I mean, if you think about photography of that era, there was a lot of a lot of conceptual work, and and there was a lot of 
funny work, too. I mean, there's an article by Tim Davis in the current issue of Aperture about um, how uh, California just seemed to spawn these funny photographers. And yet, you were trying to stay away from being very explicitly funny. And, um, and I think also, in terms of conceptual work, you weren't quite um, doing what other conceptual photographers were doing, where you're sort of stripping away uh, mm -hmm. content mm -hmm. and also using a more sort of snapshot aesthetic. Um, and this was something that you encountered in your first photography show with um, at uh, Cal University of Calif Southern California, Long Beach, yeah. uh, which was a show of, in 1973 with Robert and Robert Heineken and Minor White. And it was called um, a doc, it was, it was, the theme was documents, concepts, and metaphor. And I think you sort of encountered um, an interesting reaction. Um, people really weren't sure what they were looking at. I mean, why, why take a picture of a saw blade? Yeah. And in fact, like not looking to all of the, you know, the information in the picture that sort of took away from the fact that it wasn't just a, a documentary picture of an object. Right. And the impossibility of some of these objects. Yeah. But it's a strange reaction. Um, you know, and again, this is my first photography show. I've been lots of shows with the, you know, with the sculpture and the. Uh, and conceptual shows. Yeah. But this this was the first one before a true, you know, an entirely yeah. uh, photog photographic audience. Do you think they expected less from? I mean, you you mentioned once that you kind of felt like you just wanted to fill your artwork up and just fill it with stuff, and make it more and more complex. Well, I I had sort of been part of that entire less is more aesthetic for. Yeah for, I don't know, at least 10 years, mm -hmm. and kind of believed in it, and then little by little believed in it less and less, and um, at some point I just decided I wanted to fill it up with things. Yeah. Things and ideas and stories, and, and at that point it just sort of um, went out from, outward from this kind of picture. Yeah, and so, so now I, I'd like to, we'll sort of segue into the process part of the talk. Um, Robert had a lot of long drives on California highways and um, had a lot of time to think about uh, ideas for his photographs and came up with this process where he would um, use the mats, the mat board that was cut out from a mat that he would use to frame his images, the 8 by 10 uh, block and draw pictures on it, sort of starting from the upper left-hand corner and working across. And then use those as sketches to um, create the actual fabrications that he would then photograph for his 8 by 10 uh, negatives. Uh, so you'll be seeing a few of these pictures. Yeah. Do you want to cycle through them, or should I just? Uh, let me see if, um, if there's anything else. They, um, you know, of course, sketches are always so you don't forget you know, ideas that you've come up with, but I had another reason for it um, in that I had I'd made the mistake of making these incredibly elaborate props and then finding out that the idea was, like two weeks later, that it was really a stupid piece mm -hmm. and I'd wasted all this time and money and effort. and <laughs> So I, I had made a law to myself that nothing would be done until it had been a sketch on one of these sketch boards for at least two weeks. So you'd sketch and then, it and then wait of, two weeks and then see if you could build it. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna focus in on some of these. I just want to cycle through all of them. There are nineteen of them. And you might catch a glimpse of different works here and there, which we're gonna focus in on. Is this a which what? Am I too close to the? Okay. Not sure. So, uh, some of these some of these pages are more important than others. And then, as the years these these pages are from 1973 to 1979, and and the style definitely changes on the last one here, um, 1979. And these became more sketches for paintings rather than photographs. And they were much more than just, uh, you know, thumbnail 
yeah. notations. They were. So for instance, on this one, if you have the pointer there, we've got our Ansel Adams table. And this was the final product. And um, it's, not as, it's not all exactly what it looks like here. This table is pretty short. I think it's only a foot high. It's uh, tilted upwards. And it, the actual shape is a trapezoid, so it looks like perspective. Forced perspective. And the, um, the ground here is uh, contact paper. And the perspective is you have um, large raisins and small, small raisins. And then from here to here, the raisins get put, the raisins get put in, the, in the bread. That's, so that that's the, the entire story. So that the second piece of bread looks like it's farther away. Right, small piece of bread. <laughs> it was based on um, um, a story someone told me about Ansel Adams when he was doing a I think a, com a commercial job for some bakery in San Francisco. He was, the, the raisins came out really awful looking. They had stains around them. And yeah. so he tweezed out holes in, the, in a piece of blank white bread, put in fresh raisins, <laughs> which for a straight photographer was like awfully yes. conceptual. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so this, this, this is, is the scene of the crime. This is where it was shot. Oops. Oops. Right about there. And a lot of Robert's work was shot around this house. Kind of, that garage is where the studio was, basically. This was the, uh, my shop, my wood shop. Back in the middle was the darkroom and bathroom, and then the very, very end was the, uh, the office space. Where is that? Uh, Orange, Orange, California. And so you can see this is kind of, this strip of path here is, um, whoops, is on the side of the house. Um, uh, and I, was, I think with this one, I was just beginning to do these uh, outdoors at night pictures. And I wanted something that would um, work, that, work with an 8x10 the way no other camera could. And this was a, probably a foot long piece of uh, clothesline. And I found this um, thin copper wiring. That was, it seemed like it was thinner than a human hair. Mm -hmm. And it took three of, three of these wires to, to hold this up. But if you look close on, on, the, on the contact point, you can actually see it. Yeah, you can. And, and you can also see that, which I didn't realize when I first saw this, that the end of the contact, I mean, the end of the clothesline is painted white there, and then, and then you cut it. Or no, you cut that piece, yeah, and this then was switched the it around. This was the beginning. Cut it here, Yeah. and flipped it around, and then flipped these around. Even though it's, it's called black and white, white and black rope trick. And also flip the negatives, or oh, flip, yeah. flipped one negative. <laughs> so these, yeah, and then this is another that we're going to talk about in a bit. But this was also kind of inspired by the side of the house. Um, it was also, um, I wanted to f shoot it. There's actually only, there's one a uh, piece of siding on this, and there, it was shot at such an angle, so it looks like a corner when you flip the negative. Oh, yeah. If that makes any sense. And the two balls are in the same place here uh, with just more balls added. And you can see some of the wires holding the, holding the balls in place. This is another one, by the way, not the one you're, you're just looking at, but it was a, yeah. in the same series. Right. And... Um, and this was while you were at uh, Chapman University Chapman as an yeah. um, artist in residence, and, and you were working there for a week, and students could come and kind of watch you work, stand behind you, and breathe over your neck. Actually, there, were, there was sort of a cordon. They couldn't get that close. Okay, good. <laughs> it, was, it was a bit creepy, though. I mean, it, people watching you work like that. Um, decorator tests. This, uh, there were several uh, works that involved this little scenario. Um, this is what it really looks like, smaller in scale than you might have imagined. All contact paper. Do you want to flip back for a second? Yeah. 
Um, and there were always, uh, at least for this body of work, there were always giveaway pieces uh, so that you wouldn't be entirely fooled by, you know, that this was something normal. And in this one, it's like the, the molding ending before it gets, ending before it gets to the edge of the picture. Um, and when you get to the top of the stairs, the top uh, stair is only a couple inches, and then it just drops off. There's no landing. Yeah. Yeah, these are the kinds of images that you can, you just, they, they tell you more and more the more you look at them. And I appreciate that, that you were always kind of, you were, you were laying all the information out on the table in terms of this is not a real picture. But it, was, it always took a little searching to figure out what exactly was going on. And then, so around, I don't, I guess it must have been the night in the middle of the 70s, you, you came up with this motif of the circular saw. And um, it was amazing how many people thought this was a real saw cutting through a piece of board. <laughs> it's, a, it's a circular saw blade on a broomstick which is just leaning on a piece of plywood. But amazing how many people would just say, boy, that's kind of dangerous, isn't and it? And you drew on the negative to create the sparks. Yeah, saw this with um, rapidograph marks. Yeah. But that evolved more into a later drawing. This was from, um, I mean, this is included in, in Equilibrium in the rotary disc, of course. It's actually the, the leading role. The leading, yes, the leading role. Um, how big was the original of this? The actual drawing? Yeah. About 8 by 10. Okay. Kind of, kind of and small. It, and it's a scratch board as scratch well? Scratch board. Yeah. Um, and you just told me that someone just recreated this piece in real life. Someone in Belgium sent me a photo <laughs> who had just, who has just recreated it. And he had to go and search for the right waterfall for a very long time. I spent a long time looking at waterfalls. <laughs> But it was um, in the book, it became clear what this thing did. It spun on the crest of a waterfall at just the right speed. Uh, it had scoops on the, uh, where the blades would be. Um, and if it, if it spun too fast, it would sort of fly upstream. And if it spun too slow, it would be uh, sort of destroyed on the, the rocks below. So it just kind of hovered there on the, yeah. on the crest of the waterfall. Is that where the circuit, did you always, did the motif start with that, or was that something that evolved over time, the waterfall aspect? Oh, um, I don't know. It was the only time the, the idea of a waterfall came in. Yeah. More, these are also sort of similarly themed from 1976. And um, also, you did do, you did more sort of performance pieces in the late 70s, or at least you performed yourself for the camera. A um, couple videos. These were the Arm pen, pen, point, pen point choreography. Uh -huh. And there is a dance associated with this. Uh, there is, yeah. This was, um, I had designed the performance for, um, for performers using these things. It was kind of like uh, Tai Chi, with these slow arm motions. And as the, the arms hit the other people, the other, um, the other performers, it would, they would let out this chime. Yeah. So it was chime, chime, chime. Were they tuned to different notes? No, no. No, no. but they did sound good. They did sound good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just some more examples. This is... Uh, is a toy boat afloat in a small pond upon setting sail sinks reflection. And I, you really wouldn't be able to tell if you saw this first image that that's not a reflection. But in the second image, there is actually a second little boat there that's sunk to the bottom of the pond, quote unquote pond, or gutter that had accidentally flooded outside the side of your house. The plumbers were working on the fix <laughs> fixing the broken pipe. <laughs> And happily, they created a pond for this. And you, yet you can see that there's a dowel. You've intentionally left the dowel here on the right side of the image on the second 
part of the diptych that was the piece that is holding up the boat, the second little boat underneath the water in the first image. And the water is, in fact, a pane of glass. Oh. And um, this is more uh, reflections on uh, pieces of glass, reflections uh, off of mirrors. These were shot at uh, Joshua Tree National Monument uh, one night. Mm -hmm. And this came from uh, when you were teaching drawing? I, d I taught draw drawing for years. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it had never occurred to me, like when I was doing the shadow demo, so now we're going to work on shadow light and shadows. Scratching making, on the blackboard. Yeah, making, a dry, making this drawing on the, no, actually making that drawing on the blackboard and saying, look how dark this gets, it, when in fact doing the ac absolute opposite, making it lighter. Yes, yeah, so you're um, drawing with white chalk and saying, look how dark this is getting. And it just sort of goes by the board. It's just a sort yeah. of fantastic revelation. <laughs> so <laughs> that you're actually doing something completely in reverse. This is what you're sort of picturing in your mind, but this is what it actually looked like. On the blackboard to the class. Yes. And no one had ever pointed it out to me either. There's usually some smart ass who would have, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so in this in this piece, you actually used this first image as a negative to print the second image. Yeah, it's called a, it's called a paper. A paper, paper negative. negative. You take a, a picture and you put it in a contact printer, shine light through it, and it gives you the, the reverse. Mm -hmm. So. And towards the end of the 70s, um, you had this commission to go wander around the uh, back lot of Universal Studios and ended up shooting about, I don't know, over 100 shots of um, different yeah, different more scenes. Like, more like 250, I think. 250. And it was sort of appropriate that this is, this is where you ended up doing this commission, considering the con continuity stills from the early 70s that you were fascinated with. It was kind of like everything connected in a loop. Yeah. And it wasn't long after this assignment that you decided to move back to um, to the East Coast. And get into painting. Uh, this was still in California. Uh, this is at my, my studio between the, ho the, the house and the garage. And it's kind of hard to see where this, this is a, it's probably a six foot by four foot painting, which is here and here. Uh, I had gotten the notion that um, you know I had, I had done bl exclusively black and white work for uh, I don't know eight or nine years, and I was getting very tired of it. I really wanted to do you know do color pictures, um, but artists hadn't figured out yet, figured out at that point how to do large scale color prints. Um, so I started doing them in, in oil paint on canvas, mm -hmm. and the series of paintings would take off like I would I'd come up with the idea on a little sketchboard, build the prop, take the photograph, and then instead of just, yeah. instead of just leaving it alone, uh, raise the scale and, and finish off by painting. And I think this, this series went for about three or four paintings. Yeah. And I just uh, gave up. It was just, it was, it was like being a human camera. Yeah. And it just did not fit um, the, you know, what it should have felt like. But you did stick with painting. And, and I did. sort of I, after I, I, after the Universal job, your your interest in photography kind of trickled off, and your interest in Los Angeles kind of trickled off. Yeah, it kind of waned. Yeah, it, it was a good time to change a lot of things, especially since it had, you know, sort of yeah. finished itself off in a nice loop. Right. So the the alternative to those very tight realist paintings, I think I worked on it for another couple of years, and starting at small scale and then medium size. And then finally, these large scale, uh, they're, they're actually, it's a watercolor technique, but it's actually acrylic paint. Oh, okay. On paper, they're six feet across and five feet high. Yeah. Uh, this one is called Complex Cups, and it, um, the cups have um, silhouettes of people uh, around the edges. And um, 
I just wanted to show this as well. Whoops, sorry. Um, as an example of some of the very detailed drawing that you're doing at the end of the 70s. This is uh, from a page, a s uh, spread from Equilibrium and the Rotary Disc, the last artist book. And um, it's just. Well, this was, um, um, I, was, I was aiming towards fabricating this entire uh, kind of mill uh, kind of plant that would have manufactured things like the rotary disc. Right. And it was every, it was everything, um, you know, I'd remembered about small New England towns. Can we go back there for a second? Sure. Um, for instance, the in the beginning, they, they would have, uh, they're in river valleys, the river flows through. Um, these sort of water belt structures that sort of tap the, the flowing water from the river. And then later, the sort of like expansion and expansion, workers' houses looking, you know, all the same. And then finally, about a, in the 19th century, you know, the more modern um, uh, type of architecture, with a little bit of Greek revival in the main villa, yeah. the main gate, and then the Greek, in the uh, Parthenon. Of course. And these are some of the things that are manufactured. And the spinning apostrophe up there too was a was a motif. Uh, and the water waterfall that looked like the rotary disc. Repeating motif. And commas that looked like um, commas. Uh, spinning things that could cut things, spinning blades, and so on and so on. Yeah. This is another version of the rotary disc scratch board, and you didn't give up photography altogether right away, but you you did move to four by five and color. Um, I started. I started nice to work. need to photograph things as they really looked. You were sort of seeking, and not, you're, and not yeah. to monkey around with them. To you're seeking the absurd out in the real world, and the, like for instance, this is a, a, a bucket shattered in sub-zero temperatures. I mean, this was uh, uh, the first year I'd moved back to New England, and it's cold weather. Yeah. Sometimes it's cold enough to just break bu break plastic buckets. Yeah. Not cutting exercises. And um, you got you started to become fascinated with watermelons. I did at least one watermelon piece a year in the summer. This is a nice one. This is from '82. And this would be—is this acrylic as well or watercolor? Yeah, um, acrylic, acrylic on paper. Very large. Uh, I think it's six feet across, five feet high, mm -hmm. and it has uh, these. These all have um, captions on the bottom. Um, but you can't, I made them so that you couldn't see them within five feet. Or on a slide that I created at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, but so continuing with painting, you also began to do, um, get back to sculpture. This was um, one of the largest sort of public sculptures that you did. This was one of uh, one of three sculptures done in this one park in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. and Another example of large scale. It's called the Beehive Books. It's uh, on Nantucket it's from 1990. And then um, you you also began to kind of mix sculptural and two dimensional works. Um, this is called Scissor Game Four Sets. And this extends out from a flat piece of canvas, I believe, or wood, carved wood. Uh, close. It's some sort of arc, uh, like mat material, board foam that, bore. that you've some kind treated of and nailed and, and created this structure that comes out. Um, and some of these works are actually very reminiscent of, of the earlier photographs from the 1970s. Um, but instead of, and, but they're also very large, and to hang on the wall. This was another um, move. <laughs> oh, excuse me, that was me. <laughs> uh, Janet Borden and I have this sort of dilemma every time we have to think up a <laughs> think up a show. What are you going to show this year? Uh, I don't know. Um, I'd always been interested in cutting silhouettes, so um, silhouettes kind of insinuate themselves into the history of photography back in the 19th century. So. So we, we've done how many? Four silhouette shows now? <laughs> this one is, oh, the other one oh. was called Archangel. Uh, this one is 
the Whitney Biennial. The, um, this is a quote from, uh, what was it? Oh, uh, John, John Bunyan? Bun Bunyan? Um, is that John Bunyan? What was the name of the book again? I, I forget. I'm sorry. Pilgrim's Progress. Yes. Wanton professor and damnable apostate. <laughs> I just love the crankiness of that. <laughs> Spewing, just yeah. angry as hell over wanton apostates and wanton professors. <laughs> And then, but the most recent work that you've been working on are large scale paintings and pastels and drawings. Um, this uh, is an example. I had, I had, had a, a, a big retrospective, for, I think in 92, um, okay. with you know, hundreds of pieces from over the years. And it's, uh, it happens to a lot of artists. It's, it's supposed to be kind of, I don't know, reinforcing or mm -hmm. invigorating. But it's, I found that a lot of art, artists go through deep depressions after these things. I knew about this and did everything I, I could to ward it off, but it just, it just didn't work. I was just totally. I just wanted to dump everything, yeah, and back and turn around and back out of this little space. And so I started going to uh, figure drawing classes. You mm -hmm. know, where you just have a model and learning anatomy, and it was, it was quite fun. Um, but you turned it into something too. Finally. In turning it into something a few years later. These are, um, I'd say about four feet by five feet, uh, oil paint on canvas. Okay. No, oil paint on paper. Or smaller, this is a smaller work, charcoal. Uh, probably 32 by 38. Yeah. And so, and you have a show coming up in Los Angeles of, of a different kind of work too, the, the uh, Hollywood images. Um, I think it opens on October 26th. And um, Jana will be showing them also. Um, uh, next, we don't have a date yet. Next month sometime. So, by coastal. So, um, I guess we can open up to questions now. Thank you.